Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, and every now and then we come up with something from the future. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles From the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and the forthcoming McCartney Legacy series, uh, which I'm writing with Adrian Sinclair. And um, I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a participant in a video podcast, Talk More Talk, about the solo Beatles. Hey, Ken, how's it going? Good. How are you, Alan? Pretty good. You um, finding things to do all locked down and everything? Oh, I, I'm, I always find things to do, especially with my work on the Beatles. It's never ending. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. And Darren DeVivo, a DJ at WFUVFM 90.7 in the New York City area since 1983. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. How's it going with you, Darren? Everything is uh, is relatively neato on my end. Hi, everyone. Okay. And today we're going to look back at Paul McCartney's first solo album, McCartney, uh, which was released just 50 years ago earlier this month. It's still April as we record this, and uh, it seemed like a good time to have a look back at it. But first, of course, we have some news from Ken. Ken? Yeah, you know we never address these anniversaries, Alan. I don't know what it is about us. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have any anniversary to celebrate, do we? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in news, uh, this past Saturday on the Beatles YouTube channel, they ran the film Yellow Submarine, a sing-along version, and it generated an estimated seventy thousand viewers. And Ringo had teased fans online a few days ahead by saying something big was coming for that Saturday at 12 noon, but gave it away a few days beforehand. And still it was fun to watch. A fellow Beatles DJ podcaster, Sam Wiles, became a huge star when CNN did a report on this broadcast of Yellow Submarine and showed a picture of Sam in front of his large TV screen holding up a yellow submarine album in one hand and a yellow submarine figurine in the other. Sam hosts the Paul McCartney podcast, Paul or Nothing. Hmm. Way to go, Sam. Instant karma, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I know I could How hear Alan. I, I heard Alan How come I didn't blow. end up on CNN? I don't I know. I was jumping around in front of my TV screen well, anyway, too much information. Did you have the right toys and signs? <laughs> oh, I had toys and signs, all right. <laughs> Where was the Yellow Submarine beer can? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I know I heard you singing along, Alan. I could hear you up in Maine. So, <laughs> Yeah, I like the counting song. <laughs> the counting. <laughs> That's a fun one for you, is it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, other news, uh, Paul McCartney performed on March the 11th for the live broadcast of One World Together at Home, which aired on most of the major networks, a two-hour concert to raise money for COVID-19. Paul performed a slowed-down, bluesy rendition of Lady Madonna in what looked like a pre tape performance. He was supposed to be at his home in Sussex. It was just Paul and a keyboard alone, and I know both of you saw that. Mm -hmm. Any comments on Paul's performance. How about you, Alan? Well, I kind of like the idea that he did a different version of it. Um, and uh, but you know, I mean, part of that was because of the um, state of his voice, I think. And uh, you know, the the voice wasn't great, but on the other hand, you know, it was kind of a, an interesting, different performance by Paul McCartney, and it. You know, so fine. You know, I, I I think we talked last time about how I think Darren was hoping it wouldn't be maybe I'm amazed and it wasn't maybe I'm amazed. Um, <laughs> I think I would have also liked to have heard him play the actual, you know, keyboard introduction to Lady Madonna the way it was. He, he did something a, a bit uh, simpler. But you know what? I've heard him play it, so it doesn't really matter. 
Well, you know, as it was pointed out to me in the other podcast show that I do, Talk More Talk, he did a version like this that was similar in the special for Chaos and Creation in the Backyard. Mm -hmm. He did a bluesy version of Lady Madonna, kind of like this one. Yeah. So it wasn't the first time he's done this. Right. Yeah. Darren, how about you? Uh, I, I don't It was tough to tough to listen to. It really, really, really bothers me to say that. But I mean, I, I mean, he he uh, you know, I'm taking this from a personal angle. He seemed old. You know what I mean? He you know, he, he did, just didn't seem sharp. You could tell he was reading from a teleprompter. It was uh and and even the speaking voice has taken a hit and uh there were times when he was doing lady madonna i thought all right not bad for someone who has had issues who's uh you know the age that he is but overall you know it it, it was kind of uh i would painful was not a good description but i felt sad when it was over that mm. you know Hey, this is how he sounds now. Yeah, well, we've talked a lot about his voice on this show, and I don't want to belabor it. You know, it, we know that yeah. his voice is not what it used to be, but the main thing is that he did this for a very good cause. Right, I actually right. like this particular arrangement a lot. <laughs> and it also surprised me that he chose Lady Madonna, but he worked that in because his mother was a, a midwife. So for all the nurses and all the hospital oh. people and people on the yeah. front line, he made that connection. As soon as he mentioned his mother, I thought, oh, here we go. It's going to be let it be. Yeah. But it wasn't. Right. So um, it was a nice surprise in that regard. But I was kind of hoping that he would do something that was more called for, like um, Hope of Deliverance would have been perfect for a situation like this. Yeah. But he probably went for something more familiar like Lady Madonna. So, yeah, his voice is not what it used to be. We all know that. And so many of us have seen him in concert many, many times. And I still applaud him because, and I, I'm not going to mince words here. I, I know that it's not what it was in the 60s or 70s, or even he sounded great to me, you know, in the 2000s. Um, mm -hmm. But you could go through a whole concert of McCartney, almost three hours long. He could be shaky in the beginning. Then, for some reason, his voice gets strong for a long time. Then he hits a few clunkers. Then it's strong again. But still, he marches on. He does these shows for three hours. And, you know, it's still a marvel that he can get through it and still sound very good. I'm not great like he used to, but he's giving you his all when he does a concert. And this was only one song. Who knows if his voice was warmed up for this? I don't know. I don't know the circumstances behind it. I just know that it was for the best of causes. And, uh, you know, I applaud him and everybody else that turned up for that show. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, this is, this is the thing. Like when, when I was at the Times, we, we, we sometimes broke this rule. But we, generally speaking, tried not to review benefit concerts. Because if you review a benefit concert, you know, if you're writing a review, you have to be honest at whether you, you know, something is good or bad or you like it or don't like it or it's, you know, up to snuff or not. And you're in a position of reviewing someone who's donating his time and his art to a cause. And it just like wasn't fair for them, wasn't fair for us, you know, wasn't fair for the reader. So we just always avoided reviewing tribute concerts. But that's sort of, um, it, I feel like a little bit like that in, in that position, you know, here talking about this in a way. Mm. Yeah, I but agree. Still, I agree. It's it's a great thing to watch in the last few weeks. There's a there's been a lot of concerts just like this. Oh yeah, all these virtual concerts, and it's a marvel how it's pulled off, and how you have band members like the Rolling Stones in four different locations, you know, <laughs> and they all sound good together. Yeah, and it's that that alone the the technology. I, I I'm so impressed with what I'm seeing, not only in in these concerts, but you know I've seen videos now on, on Facebook of of uh, like there was one from Long Island of over 50 musicians doing We Are the World from different locations. Hmm. What you can do now is so incredible. Oh, yeah. And the fact that it's pulled off like this and it's not going to be perfect like you're seeing a concert on stage. But the fact that, you know, so quickly, technology wise, we can do this. It's just amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Anyway, 
How's this for a segue? <laughs> <laughs> I just said there have been numerous streaming concerts in the past few weeks to raise money for frontline workers for COVID-19. Another one took place this past Saturday, and it was called All Together Now L.A., uh, there were many Beatles-related people performing at the show, and I made a list of them and what they did. Mark Mann, who is a great guitar player, who you know for the concert for George, the guy that wore the cap on stage, did a lot of great guitar work. Um, he was with a band called The Tribe, and they did With a Little Help From My Friends. Peter Asher appeared alone on acoustic guitar, and he did A World Without Love. Steve Lukather just did a message by himself. He didn't play at all. There's a DJ, uh, Don Cromwell, who uh, was one of the MCs for this show, and he introduced Denny Lane. But before he did that, he made sure that he said that the best concert he ever saw in his lifetime was the Wings Over America tour. So good for you there, Don. And then um, Denny Lane performed. This was the big shocker for me. You'll never guess what Denny did. Uh, Lady Madonna. <laughs> he did Weep for Love. Wow. Which, uh, for those of you that don't know, is a song that Denny wrote and Wings recorded during Back to the Egg. Didn't make the album. But it ended up on Denny's album called Japanese Tears. Mm-hmm. And uh, the band played on it. So, But he did that alone on acoustic guitar. And he sounded great doing that. And Lawrence Juber uh, did MacArthur Park. <laughs> on the acoustic guitar amazing that's such a complicated song mm-hmm. so many different chord changes he was just fantastic doing that kip winger had a, a super band that included alan parsons and mark hudson and alan parsons himself teamed up with david pack known for uh, being in ambrosia many many years ago and they did together tell me what you see and they sounded great on it too and David some of these Pack, actually, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. David Pack actually has uh, did used to be one of the go to vocalists for the Alan Parsons project. Oh, OK. Very good. Yeah. All right. So there's the connection right there. Thank you, Darren. So I know that some of these performances are now available to watch on YouTube. Hmm. All right. Very sad news to report. This is going back on April the 18th of the passing of Terry Duran. Terry was a former business associate of the Beatles and later manager of the band Grapefruit. He also managed Mary Hopkin as well. With the Beatles manager, Brian Epstein, he co-owned Brydor Cars, which supplied sports cars to many figures in the swinging London area, including members of the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Before that, Terry worked for Hawthorne, Motors. It's a car dealership that was in Warrington and sold the first car owned by a member of the Beatles. And that was to George Harrison. It was a blue Ford Anglia. And Mike McCartney, Paul's brother, took a photo of George and the Beatles posing with the car, which was used in a newspaper ad. And Terry later supplied the band with an eight-seater Ford Thames van, which Nems purchased on the group's behalf. And that was in 1962. Uh, Terry Duran managed the Beatles' Apple Publishing in the late 60s, and following the Beatles' breakup in 1970, he worked as the estate manager at George Harrison's Friar Park property and managed Harrison's London office at Dark Horse Records. He is often cited as the inspiration behind the line, meeting a man from the motor trade, and she's leaving home, although Paul McCartney himself has denied the story. And um, with special thanks to one of our listeners, Tom Brennan, who had contacted Bill Elliott from the band Splinter that recorded for Dark Horse Records. Duran traveled with Splinter on their November 1975 U.S. tour. And Bill Elliott is quoted as saying he was one of the most cool, laid-back guys I had ever met, and it was a pleasure to travel with him in America. Terry was born in 1936, so I, I don't have his exact birthday. He was either 83 or 84. On April 17th, that was the 50th anniversary of the release of Paul's first solo album, McCartney, which we're noting here on this show. And to celebrate on YouTube, they premiered the video, now in HD, for Maybe I'm Amazed. And that was at 10 a.m. in the morning. Then at 12 noon, Spotify played the entire album, along with the bonus cuts that are on the remastered album 
from the archival releases. As many of you know, with uh, most of us being stuck inside for many weeks now, lots of music fans have posted their quarantine set list of songs to play. And uh, the one most obvious song in the Beatles catalog would have to be John Lennon's song, Isolation. Hmm. Johnny Depp and Jeff Beck have recorded a brand new version of the song with Depp singing lead, kind of a bluesy arrangement of John's song, which you can now find on YouTube. And the two of them plan on making an album together. You can also find live performances of the two of them doing isolation as well. Danny Harrison, by the way, today just posted his own quarantine list of songs that he's been listening to, you know, to uh, take us through these troubled times and to relax and enjoy uh, the music. Uh, getting a lot of media attention of late is Mick Jagger's response to Paul McCartney saying that the Beatles were better than the Rolling Stones, which Paul said on the Howard Stern show. I have no doubt that Mick is just having fun with this. And in fact, what he said wasn't really all that critical of the Beatles. He said, that's so funny. He's a sweetheart. There's obviously no competition. The big difference, though, is, and sort of slightly seriously, is that the Rolling Stones is a big concert band in other decades and other areas when the Beatles never even did an arena tour. Madison Square Garden with a decent sound system. They broke up before that business started, the touring business for real. So that business started in 1969, and the Beatles never experienced that. They did a great gig, and I was there at Shea Stadium. They did that stadium gig, but the Stones went on. We started doing stadium gigs in the 70s and are still doing them now. That's the real big difference between these two bands. One band is unbelievably, luckily, still playing in stadiums, and then the other band doesn't exist. I don't think those are really harsh words no. coming from uh, from Mick, but it got a lot of attention all, all throughout social media. <laughs> Any of you want to comment? It sound, no. sounds like about right, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. More news. Ringo drums on a brand new song from country artist Ray Wiley Hubbard. It's called Bad Trick. Also on the song are Don Was, Joe Walsh, and Chris Robinson. And a new video was made of the band playing it together at Ringo's studio. With uh, There's a lot of cool Beatles stuff on the wall including uh, the front cover of the Ringo Rama album. And we've got two major video releases to talk about. Coming this July 7th, happy birthday, Ringo, to DVD and Blu-ray is the 1973 film That'll Be the Day, starring David Essex and Ringo Starr. Set in Britain in 1958, it's the story of a young man, Jim McLean, played by David Essex, who is restless at school and bored with his life, who takes a series of low-level jobs at a seaside amusement park, and with the help of his friend Mike, that's Ringo, he discovers a world of cheap sex and petty crime. That Ringo, for shame. When that world comes to a shocking, brutal end, he returns home to face his future. When the new music scene explodes, Jim has to decide between a life of social responsibility or this new phenomenon called rock and roll. It's supposed to be based on the early life of John Lennon, and this will include an audio commentary by entertainment journalist and author Brian Reisman and trailers for the film. It also has a soundtrack of classic songs from legendary acts like the Everly Brothers, Bobby Darin, Jerry Lee Lewis, Del Shannon, and Little Richard. But wait, that's not all. We've been waiting to hear about this. Coming July 28th on Blu-ray, RLJ is the company that's putting this out. And that's the documentary, An Accidental Studio. This is the one we talked about last year, which was shown on British television mm -hmm. on the history of handmade films, charting their many successes with interviews from George Harrison, Monty Python members Eric Idle, Michael Palin, Terry Gilliam, plus Bob Hoskins, Michael Caine, Helen Mirren, Ray Cooper, and Richard E. Grant. If you want more information about this release, you can go to blue-ray.com. A few last things here. As we're doing this show on April the 28th, yesterday uh, was Jim Keltner's birthday. He turned 78. Happy birthday, Jim Keltner. And tomorrow on the 29th, Klaus Vorman turns 82. God bless you. 
All right. Happy birthday to both those guys. And also, uh, yesterday on the 27th, a happy anniversary. We send out to Ringo and Barbara Bach, married now for 39 years. Wow. That is all the news. Okay. Or as I sometimes say, oh, no news. That's fit to print. <laughs> okay. So let's turn our attention to Mr. McCartney's McCartney, or I should say Sir Paul's McCartney. This was, you know, the album came, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, as uh, largely a surprise. I mean, um, the first part of the sessions for it were totally secret. Even Apple barely knew about it. Um, once one of the British music magazines sort of got on to the you know, rumors that Paul was recording, Apple's comment was, we're fairly sure that Paul will be putting out a solo album. I mean, it it was the kind of response that was like, you know, we don't really know. <laughs> um, and of course, the reason they really didn't know is because Paul was at that point keeping away from Apple pretty much. Um, he had violently disagreed with the others about whether to hire Alan Klein as manager. They went ahead and did it, uh, outvoting him three to one. His position was that that's not how we work. We're either unanimous or nothing. But, you know, Apple was now a corporation and the corporate rules allowed for three to one to win. So they hired Klein and Paul largely absented himself from Apple, especially after John made his I want a divorce announcement. Um, Paul went up to Scotland with Linda and, uh, you know, basically was trying to find himself in a way. I mean, he was trying to figure out what what there is to do for him. It seems like such a silly question to us, right? You know? But, you know, he wasn't confident. Um, he felt that being there not being a Beatles anymore was sort of like the loss of a job. And uh, this was, you know, basically the only life he knew as an adult. Then he came back to his house on Cavendish Avenue. He had borrowed a, uh, a Studer four-track deck from EMI, um, the same deck that they had recorded, you know, up through Pepper on, and they also had used it um, a little bit in uh, the White Album and Abbey Road, largely to record sound effects and loops and things like that. And he set it up and he recorded most of the album at his, in his living room at Cavendish, and uh, then went to EMI and to Morgan Studios, uh, did some mixes of the four-track material he recorded at home, and recorded some new things, maybe I'm amazed, um, particularly uh, Karina Crory, and um, let's see, uh, I'm just looking at the list here, uh, Man, We Was Lonely which he later claimed was the first song that he wrote with Linda, but didn't credit her at this point. So album came out, and uh, why don't we start with what each of your first impressions of it were, uh, Ken? It's hard for me to, to really think back at the time exactly what, what I was thinking, because I didn't know the whole history and, and what was going on in the Beatle world, and that that they were in the process of breaking up or that John had the meet. John said he wanted a divorce from the group. I just looked at it as a new McCartney album and I generally liked the songs, mainly the ones that had vocals on them mm -hmm. and uh, easily gravitated to songs like every night mm -hmm. and man, was lonely and junk and certainly maybe I'm amazed and Teddy boy and enjoyed them. And it took me a while to get used to the instrumentals, but if anything, this is an album that I've changed my opinion on a bit over the years because, you know, looking back on 50 years of solo McCartney music, he's recorded albums in so many different ways. And there are a lot of fans these days that like the very simple, pure sounds of the early music of McCartney's solo career. And... Um, in particular, like this this album, the acoustic stuff that was to follow on the next two releases, like Heart of the Country and Some People Never Know and songs like those. And 
there are those that prefer that kind of sound over more produced and more polished works. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time when this album came out, I had no idea about Paul plugging into a four track machine and making songs this way. It didn't even enter in my mind. You know, they were just the new songs of that time. It was his first album. And I felt right at home hearing mainly the songs with the vocals on them. So many of those songs, those acoustic songs, to me, could have been on the White Album. I mean, really and truly, is there that big a difference between Mother Nature's Son and Junk? We also learned later on that many of these songs he wrote while he was still in the Beatles. Junk was during the White Album. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Teddy Boy... They rehearsed during uh, the Get Back, Let It Be sessions. And uh, so, so much of this stuff, especially the acoustic stuff, was not some great big uh, change for me. <laughs> if anything, the stuff that I became more interested in were, you know, the Korean Accords, the more experimental stuff. And that was much later on. It took me a long time to appreciate that. But I love the fact that he played all the instruments which is something that I think, and I'm, I've asked a lot of people this question over the years because I'm not sure if Paul really was the first person to ever do this as far as play a variety of instruments and be the only one on the album as opposed to a folk singer just playing an acoustic guitar and nothing else on an album. But that alone makes it very interesting and has made it even more interesting because I like when artists play everything themselves. It, to me it becomes more of an intimate experience because every sound that you hear on that record is what's in his head. Mm -hmm. And even though Paul drummed a bit on Beatles records, we didn't really know how much he drummed, right. <laughs> but here we knew that he drummed on the whole album. So it was interesting in that regard later on for me to discover all this stuff and to appreciate it on that level, mm -hmm. knowing that he played all the instruments so, but initially it was just, it was an enjoyable album that I've grown to like more over the years for the reasons that I mentioned, because of that real back to basics vibe, you know, and not being in any way what some might consider overproduced, although I don't really think most of Paul's music I would ever call overproduced, maybe a few songs here and there. But, um, you know, when I listen to the album now, I can understand why a lot of people appreciate that album much more now than they did when it first came out. But, you know, it's a different experience from the people who first grew up on the Beatles and really were hearing this, these tremendous albums coming out at the end of their career as a group to go from something like Abbey Road, mm -hmm. something so perfect and, and, and polished at the same time, wonderful production, to go to something like this, which... You know, I don't want to call it crude. I think lo-fi is, is a, a, you know, a term that's used a lot. That was shocking for some people. But I just remember thinking to myself, oh, Teddy Boy, that could have been on the White Album. You know, Junk could have been on the White Album. It wasn't that big a change for me. Mm -hmm. Initially, we're only talking about my initial reaction. Mm -hmm. It's only over the years that I've, I've grown to really like the album more for other reasons. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, Darren, this uh, probably came out before you were born. <laughs> yeah, no, so, <laughs> uh, I was so, um, I was five when it came out and I had no concept of uh, McCartney initially. And it wasn't one of my first McCartney albums. I tend to I, I, I tend to I remember the, the copy, you know, of the album that I had, like the label, for example, and try to use that as a way to try to put it into uh, the time frame of how I was discovering Paul's music. I've said this on the show a bunch of times. I grew up in, I was born in 65. Mm -hmm. I'm 55 now. So I have very, very, ve some vague memories of hearing that the Beatles had broken up. And uh, I saw the Let It Be movie in the theaters when it came out. Uh, and I was five. Mm -hmm. The solo stuff uh, came to me gradually. And it was usually in the form of, of being aware of what was on, was being played on the radio and some of the singles I had. And I pretty much think the first album of Paul's that I owned was Red Rose Speedway on cassette and then Band on the Run on cassette. My copy of McCartney is not an Apple. It's on the Black Capital label, which kind of tells me that, all right, you got it probably 
sometime around maybe 77-ish, 1978 perhaps, Mm -hmm. you know. uh, So I heard McCartney amongst other McCartney albums, other Wings albums. So um, I don't remember really being, I remember I've always liked the album a lot, but I don't remember ever being totally aware of what Paul was doing on that album until many years later when you know i got older and learned more uh about how the album was recorded why it was done the way it was done it's it's place and time 1970 coming out of abbey road my opinion of it musically has always been very good consistently very good i've always liked mccartney i feel like it's not quite amongst his best but it's not far away from being amongst his best recordings Mm -hmm. um I think today now, with what we know, the 50 years of of knowledge, my opinions about the album maybe have improved a little bit. It's kind of a nervy decision, I think, on Paul's part to emerge as a solo artist with a work that they didn't call them DIY at the time. But Ken said lo-fi, lo-fi DIY. You didn't see a lot of that in 1970, especially not from an established major musician having to make an initial statement right. and doing it in this fashion. If I'm making sense of what I'm saying today, it's more commonplace, mm-hmm. but for McCartney, you would think that he was probably, uh, went into the recording thinking, at least I would, I have a lot to prove here that I could stand on my own coming off of Abbey road. Uh, I really got to make this good. My first outing and he made it good, but he did it on his terms in a totally unconventional way. Mm-hmm. It was the anti Abbey Road. Uh, mm. And I think he did that on purpose. That's my opinion, that he went into recording this thing. He was not interested. It wasn't that important to him to come out with Abbey Road 2, something right. that grant on that grand of a scale. You know, he was just going to lay down these tracks any way he could. Right. Uh, and if it meant, you know, plugging in the mics into the back of a reel to reel machine and not having a mixing console, which is very primitive uh, and uh, probably did a lot of troubleshooting early on Mm -hmm. uh, in the recording process. Uh, I think that was a very ballsy move on McCartney's part, you know, uh, to go off on his own and record something in his living room and put it out very raw, very unfinished sounding. You could tell it was like, you know, he didn't worry about the fact that he didn't have lyrics for some of the uh, some of the songs or that, you know, you take a song like Mama Miss America, two fragmented instrumentals, just stick them together. Mm -hmm. Very ballsy, very nervy move that wasn't appreciated at the time it came out. But time has been kind uh, to McCartney. And getting back to what how I started for me again, I picked up on the album after some of the wings albums of the mid seventies. So my, to me, my kind of concept of it initially was sort of blurred into everything else that was happening in the mid Mm seventies. Okay. So I think I was like 15, 16 or so when that came out and, uh, and I remember it pretty vividly. WNEW FM played the whole thing straight the first night that they could and they were good about announcing when they were going to do something like that um, so that someone like me accidentally sitting in front of a tape recorder might fall onto the record button or something and you know suddenly I had a copy I could listen to until the real album came out and I really kind of liked it I mean some of it was puzzling to me Um, I didn't really know what to make of Karina Karore Um, But, you know, lately, actually, you know, because of the McCartney Legacy Project, I've been knee deep in this album. Um, (laughs) And I watched the TV special that he watched the night before he went in and recorded Karina Karore. Um, And it's about the Karina Karore Indians in Brazil. And, you know, they are a very sort of secretive tribe. They don't deal with people. They also have some some weird things about them, like they don't use pots, okay? So the team of Brazilians who are trying to get in touch with them uh, would leave them gifts of, you know, knives and pots and, you know, whatever, and they would take everything and leave the pots. It just didn't mean anything to them, you know? Odd things. 
you know, and they were basically trying to get in touch with them because there were, you know, people working in the forest there who were sort of cutting down the rainforest and massacring Indians and, you know, when they found them. So they were trying to sort of move them to a safer place for them, but they really didn't want to be contacted. And in fact, by the end of the documentary, they still hadn't really been contacted. I mean, just just very superficially. Strangely enough, Paul hadn't actually intended to watch that. He intended to watch a boxing match um, <laughs> that was a, was a, a Joe Frazier fight um, that took place in Madison Square Garden the night before. Um, can't remember who he was fighting, but it then, you know, it was too late to watch live in Britain, so the BBC put it on the next night, uh, and the fight only took like half an hour, less than half an hour, actually, and that includes commentary. So he switched over to watch this uh, this special, and that gave him an idea for a song, which is one of the ones he recorded in the studio, and. There are some really interesting things about it. I mean, one of the things he did is he went uh, and got a bow and arrow set, took it into the studio, had, um, I think Robin Black was the engineer, it was at Morgan, and he mic'd, had mics all along so that he could capture the sound of the arrow going past, you know, and stuff like that. And basically he was, he was just really trying to, you know, he wasn't, trying to play the kind of music that you heard in the special, which, you know, there was a lot of music. Some of it was scored. Some of it was actual, uh, you know, South American, Brazilian Indian music. And uh, he, he didn't really try to approximate that, but he tried to, you know, use the fact that that music was percussion heavy. And he has, you know, you hear that part where he's like doing heavy breathing. I mean, that's sort of, you know, running through the, the jungle there and uh you know so that was a song that totally puzzled me then and i i kind of understand what he was trying to get at now maybe i'm amazed i mean i thought that was a standout from the start uh the instrumental things uh, didn't you know most most pop songs in those days weren't instrumentals but it didn't seem that odd to me because there were some instrumentals most of those i think he basically ad-libbed in his living mm -hmm. room you know, and then you had, you know, beautiful things like junk. I mean, junk is exquisite. Uh, Every night is really pretty good too. Darren, you had mentioned about you know him doing a lot of troubleshooting probably during this, and yeah, he absolutely did. And he included some of the troubleshooting on the album. I mean, the lovely Linda really is <laughs> just is just testing the machine. Um, and it's like forty three seconds long. Um, it has the noise of Linda closing the door out to the patio and, you know, and, and, and I think he said it may even have been in that press release he put out, which we should get to at some point, uh, or maybe it was in the deluxe book. But he, I think at, at some point, I think when the album first came out, he said that this was a trailer for a song to be included on another album later in its full form, but he never did it. You know, he may never have finished writing it, actually. Uh, it was one of the few songs he wrote during his little Scottish retreat uh, in October, November. Yeah, that was, you know, so that was basically my first impression of it. I liked it at the time uh, when it came out. There were parts of it like Maybe I'm Amazed I especially liked. Others I found puzzling, whatever it was. It was kind of an interesting album to hear because... You know, you it would give you something to talk about with your friends. Like, what do you think this is about? What do you think with this Krina Crory thing? I mean, what? You know, but, uh, you know, it. Uh, I think it's aged well, at least for me. And that's about it. I guess we should talk a little bit about the circumstances of its release as well. Partly because of the press <laughs> release, which... Basically, uh, it include the, the main part of it was the self-interview, um, which included him asking himself if he foresees working with the Beatles again, and he doesn't foresee that, and whether he likes the music John's doing, which doesn't please him very much. And it looked really like a pretty dyspeptic interview, but you know, most people were not aware of all of the infighting that was going on. So I think people didn't know what to make of it. Initially, 
Like it was meant to go out really just to the press. That was essentially the press kit. But everybody printed the interview, you know, publications in England, Rolling Stone printed it here. And, you know, so everyone got to see it. And that's how the whole, oh, my God, the Beatles have broken up in April 10th is, you know, was the day the press kit went out. And that's the day that we think of as the breakup of the Beatles. Although, as we all know, it's a lot more complicated than that. Ken, do you remember reading the press release at the time and the self-interview? No, I just remember the headline mm. and the newspapers. But it's right. interesting when you when you read the 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 Q and A there, mm-hmm. he never actually says that the Beatles have broken up. No, but he doesn't and, foresee uh, just that he doesn't foresee really doing anything with them again. He doesn't say definitively. You're right. Right. So I think the media interpreted that, and it's very easy to do so. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, so many of the answers that he gave, and apparently. From what I understand, some of the questions specifically about the Beatles were questions that Paul came up with himself. Is that true? That's what that's what I heard. Hmm. So um, and then I don't know if it was it was Peter Brown that came up with the questions or Mm -hmm. Derek Taylor or both. I've heard heard only Peter Brown. Yeah. You know, what happened was um, Paul was talking to Peter Brown about the fact that this album was coming out and he was not telling a lot of people at Apple about it. And uh, Peter said, well, you know, what are you going to do about publicity? And Paul didn't really, hadn't really thought about that. He knew that he didn't want to do interviews. He just, just did not want to do a press conference, didn't want to do interviews. Well, he did some, but, um, and Peter Brown came up with the idea of, you know, why don't I write up a bunch of questions as an interview and you answer them? And that was how it, it basically came about. Of course, he could have chosen not to answer some, and he could have worded things more diplomatically, but this was the mood he was in, and he mm-hmm. was feeling very combative, you know. Well, you know, it had been about six months since mm-hmm. the meeting at Apple when John said he wanted to, to quit, mm-hmm. and how long do you stay in limbo like that? Right. And and not tell the public what's going on. You have to say something at some point, especially when you're putting out a new album. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that he took a different view than George and Ringo. When they recorded I Me Mine on January 3rd, 1970, John was in Denmark, um, so he didn't go to those sessions. And the three of them did have a discussion about, you know, do you think he really meant it? in September and let's just wait and see, you know, whether this blows over and he'll want to do something again. And George and Ringo were proceeding along those lines. They had their own projects too that they were or would soon be doing. But, you know, when you you think about um, the interviews that they did at the time, um, uh, Ringo did a TV interview with David Frost and basically said they'd be recording together again, most likely. Uh, George Harrison, well into 1970, May 1970. So we're talking about after Paul's QA has come out. Right. And and uh, Howard Smith asks him, you know, will the Beatles make another album? And, and George says, well, they'd be awfully selfish not to, you know. Hmm. Uh, hmm. He's, and he says, I, I just think that, you know, everyone's getting a little, it's just a little bit of bitchiness, but, you know, everybody's going to grow up and we will, you know, undoubtedly work together again. And in that same interview, he talked about the deal that John had proposed a few weeks before his divorce uh uh, announcement, which was, you know, f- four songs for him, four songs for Paul, four for George, two for Ringo. He basically said that to Howard Howard Smith, right? And, you know, it's funny when you, you listen to those interviews at the time, and it was great hearing them, but, you know, you listen to them now, and you know a whole lot more about what's going on and why he's saying that particular thing. It's really yeah. interesting. You know, we've talked about yeah. this before, Alan, and you were under the impression that because to me uh, i just think that the status of the beatles from the moment they had that meeting where john said he wanted a divorce through the end of 1970 anything could have happened really Mm -hmm. they were in a you know in limbo at that time a lot of people think as soon as the mccartney album came out and that q a was released 
that was it. It was. That was definitely the end. <laughs> it was. But 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 it, anything could have happened. I'll tell you why it couldn't. That. Anything couldn't have happened so long as Alan Klein was in the picture. Paul was not going to do anything else that obligated him in any way to Alan Klein. He was, even with his own album, he was very upset that when the trade ads came out, they said, you know, on Apple Records, an APCO managed company. He was furious about that. Yeah. So anything that would have made more money for Alan Klein, obligated him to deal with Alan Klein, and nothing, it's simply not possible that they could have got together. If he had taken the same attitude as Ringo and George, then yeah, if John came back and said, oh, what the hell, let's do something, he'd have been there. But the whole Alan Klein thing, I think, made that impossible. It just wasn't going to happen. All right. So you're telling you're telling me, you're telling our listeners that I suppose it's very possible mm -hmm. if John had phoned up Paul after the McCartney album came out and said, you know what, let's make a new album. Paul would have said no. I think so. I think really? so. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You know, he had um, I think you have to take into account how worked up he was about Alan Klein by this point. I mean, keep in mind, this album is about to come out. He wants it to come out on April 17th. Alan Klein says to George and Ringo and John, uh, no, that'll screw up the release of Let It Be um, and also Ringo's album. So he can't do it. He has to put it forward a month or whatever, a few weeks. And George and John wrote a letter to Paul explaining this, and they went out of their way to try and placate him. They hand wrote it, for instance, instead of having it, you know, typed by somebody. John actually wrote it, and George signed it too. And then Ringo went and hand delivered it. You know, they were trying to deal with him with kid gloves. They knew exactly how angry he was. And he threw Ringo out. And then mm -hmm. they caved. They basically said, okay, you can have April 17th. And they moved Let It Be forward. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, also uh, he had sent a note via John Eastman to Apple the day before the, uh, the press kit went out with the self-interview saying, uh, yeah, we're supposed, to, uh, we're supposed to meet to talk about Let It Be, the film, today. Um, I'm not coming to that meeting. And by the way, neither I nor Linda nor our daughter Heather signed a release to allow you to use our names and likenesses in the Let It Be film. <laughs> wow. Um, <Woo. laughs> you know... Uh, and obviously they were able to get around that. I mean, he was still part of the partnership, you know, the Beatles, Beatles Inc., uh, which became Apple and, you know, not Inc., probably limited, but, you know, the Beatles company became Apple and he was still a partner. And this is when he began realizing, you know, also he had, he hadn't initially gone to Apple to put this out. He went to EMI and said, I want this out April 17th. And EMI said to him, mm, you know, you're part of this partnership and the partnership agreement for the Beatles is part of the EMI contract with the Beatles. And it says that you have to get Apple's okay to put this out on a particular date. So he had to go to Apple and then they said no. So he's now beginning to realize, you know what? I have to be out of Apple. I have to be out of Apple. And if, you know, the way to do that is to get out of the Beatles partnership, I have to do that. And that ultimately led to the lawsuit that he launched on December 31st, 1970. He really didn't want to do that. And so he was trying, you know, it, around this point and for, for really the rest of the time until the loss, until the writs were served to persuade John and George principally, I mean, Ringo would have done whatever the majority wanted, I think, that he should be let out of the contract. And they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't discuss it even. So it was, it, it was, it was really quite a, a, a fraught period. And that's why I think that even if John said, let's do something, I mean, who knows, you know, you, you, you can never tell, you know, Linda might have said, uh, listen, Paul, 
you know, you should calm down and consider doing it. And, and maybe he would have listened to her. But who knows? You know, it, 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 it just doesn't seem very likely given how angry he was, given how at every single turn, you know, it may look like Paul is just trying to be a pain in the butt by saying you can't, we haven't signed releases to be in the film. But at the same time, Alan Klein was doing things to him too, you know, and they were both, both sides were sort of stacking up these grievances. Alan Klein, not so much because he was, you know, a businessman and the kind of businessman he was, and he would just let whatever Paul did roll off his back and say, okay, now it's my turn. And he would fire some salvo that would really irritate Paul, you know? Mm. So, so that's where we were, you know? And so he's thinking of this album, this album in a way was an escape for him. It was in a way, uh, it was also a way of establishing, you know, himself as, a force within the Beatles that has to, you know, go on after the Beatles, what it's going to be. Um, so in a way, what you're saying is that the release of this album and the Q&A that went out to the press really didn't in any way affect the outcome. It was going to happen anyway. If he was so determined not to want to work with Alan Klein mm -hmm. uh, at all, then what he said in this Q&A doesn't really matter all that much. He had his mind made up anyway. Right, right. He just thought that it was time someone said it. I mean, he had said it to Life magazine the previous November right. when he said the Beatles thing is over. But yeah, he, he from his point of view, it's like, I'm not going to be in limbo. We're either in the Beatles or we're not in the Beatles. John doesn't want to be in the Beatles. The rest of the Beatles want Klein as their manager. I'm out of here. You know, mm. it's a I, pity. I, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I trust all the work that you've done there. It's just so hard for me to believe sometimes that, you know, Paul loved John so much. Yeah. That if John actually said, guys, let's do something, it have to be somewhat difficult for Paul to say no. But because of the whole Klein factor. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, when did Alan Klein first be, get mentioned in the picture? When did he emerge? Uh, when in 19, what was it? Was it? towards the end of 68 or was it it was 69. in 1969 it was um in i think february 69 it was right after the let it be sessions now so, we so. know that klein uh was a controversial figure right and when he was being brought into apple he had managed not made was he managed the rolling stones right was he considered manager yeah no for or, well he was there okay he, he uh, was there, I don't know how you would describe it, not so much manager as their accountant, lawyer, you know, general right. looker, looker over of their financial interests, um, which turned out in the end to be really more his financial interests, the Stones found out. Um, well, the Stones were at that time already kind of becoming suspicious yeah. of Klein, because didn't Mick Jagger not warn he warned Paul. John, beware of Klein. Now, yeah, um, was the last thing McCartan the last thing John heard from Mick Jagger was that Klein was good, got the the Stones a more lucrative contract from Decca, and that is actually why John agreed to meet with Klein. And Paul, however, spoke to Mick subsequently, and and the Stones were getting suspicious. And this was all during a fairly short time. I mean, John first met Klein, but really just to shake hands and say hi at the Rolling Stones Rock and Roll Circus. So that's December 68. In January, John gave an interview uh, where he's saying, listen, you know, Apple's, Apple's going to be broken and Beatles are going to be broken any time now. I mean, he gave this, you know, huge catastrophizing interview about how all the money's just flowing out the door. Klein is back in New York after the Rolling Stones rock and roll circus. He reads this and says, you know, wow, I can get the Beatles, which he'd always wanted. He had tried to work out a deal with Epstein in 1964. Epstein didn't like him very much, so he didn't do anything. And Nat Weiss, who was Epstein's lawyer, really didn't like him. So they kept Alan Klein as far away as possible all that time. Now Klein sees John saying that, you know, financially they're in a mess. 
And he flies back to London without even a meeting set up with John, keeps leaving messages at Apple. John had heard from Mick about the Stones' new contract, and he said, I'm going to go meet with the guy. And he met with him, and, and that night of the very first meeting, he basically decided, okay, my stuff is going to be with Klein. You guys do what you want. And George and Ringo said, yeah, ours too. And Paul said, not so fast. Now, what I was going to ask is, uh, was McC- McCartney was basing his his uh, his leery, le- leeriness, is that a word? Yeah. Paul was basing his, uh, was he basing it just on, what he was hearing from Mick Jagger at the time was no. he being uh, was he being advised by his father-in-law and Linda's family? Klein's bad news. Yeah, I mean, but not just Paul them. Form yeah. this from the beginning. This opinion that nope, I'm not working with Alan Klein. Yeah. Where did that come from? You know, Klein had a reputation that was discoverable. You know, not like today, he couldn't just Google him and say what's going on, unfortunately. But for instance, um, when I interviewed Peter Asher for the book, he was talking about how as soon as he knew Klein was going to run Apple, he quit. He quit, didn't wait to be fired. He just quit and left with James Taylor. And I said, well, you know, had you and Paul discuss this? Did, you know, were you influenced by Paul's feeling about Klein? And he said, no, I knew from a lot of friends in the music world in New York that Klein was bad news. And in fact, I might have said it to Paul. So Paul was getting it from all kinds of places. You know, he was hearing it from his in-laws, from Peter Asher, from, you know, other musicians, from Mick. And he just felt, you know, but you know what? Even... Even when it came down to signing Klein on May 9th, 1969, he's arguing with the Beatles over his percentage, Paul is. Um, Mm. They're saying, yeah, Klein wants 20% and he has to bring it to his board tomorrow and we have to sign right now. And Paul said, wait a minute. First of all, tomorrow is Saturday. He's not meeting with his board on Saturday. And second, 20%, we're a big act. He'll take 15 and they were saying, no, no, he, he should have 20. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and they just signed. And uh, so but it makes you wonder, OK, if they had agreed to tell Klein he could take 15 and Klein said, yeah, I'll take 15, w- would Paul have signed then? I don't know. I mean, why is he even bringing that up if he's that implacably opposed to Klein? You know, the others thought he was stalling. And maybe that's what he was. I don't know. Back to the McCartney (laughs) album, though. I can tell you um, one other fairly little known fact. Um, Paul has said it publicly, so it's not that unknown. But um, we ran into a 1980 interview that he gave with someone on the BBC. And it dealt with this very homespun aspect of McCartney, which is like, you know, it's thoroughly in the weave of what we think about the McCartney album, right? Homespun. Mm. He said, you know, I did think for a while that maybe this should just be a demo of the album and I should go into EMI and do the whole thing properly because it does sound a little, you know, homemade. But on the other hand, I felt that, you know, sometimes when you do that, you kind of lose the spirit of the original you know, DIY recording. He didn't put it that way, but, you know, you lose the spirit of the original. And I, you know, just wanted to keep that spirit. So I decided to leave it this way. But, you know, it could very well have been a very different album if he had gone into EMI. It could have been an album more like uh, Maybe I'm Amazed, you know, all sounding like that. I mean, Maybe I'm Amazed sounds a lot better than a lot of the other tracks. Uh, you know, a few of them do, the ones he did in the studio. Uh, so it, it, it could have been more like that. And he could have thought of bringing, bringing in a, a, an orchestrator, you know, to do some some arrangements for things. But in the end, he decided that he wanted it this way. But but um, I hadn't run into that before, uh, before we started researching. And um, it was kind of an interesting thing to me that he considered it. I have a question. Alan, did you... 
because you hear so much about it starting on a, a four track machine at Paul's home. Mm-hmm. But then he went to Morgan Studios mm-hmm. and he transferred some of the four track recordings to eight track. Mm-hmm. He recorded a number of songs there. Hottest Sun was done there. Queen of Cora was done there. Mm-hmm. He did final mixes for Junk and Teddy Boy there. Mm-hmm. They did this, the segging of Hottest Sun and Glasses there. Right. Uh, Mama Miss America was edited together there. I don't know if it was started there or not. I, th- I think it was started at at, uh, at his home. Well, Mama Miss America was recorded all at home, but they okay. joined in the studio, like you said. Okay. Yeah. And then Abbey Road Studios, he made Every Night there. He made Maybe I'm Amazed there. And the last song that they worked on was Man Who Was Lonely. Mm-hmm. So there was quite a lot of stuff that was done in a professional studio mm-hmm. on eight-track machines. It just was started on a four-track. And Creed so McCrory maybe, was too. Don't forget that one. <laughs> yeah. So maybe, you know, we have this image because you're always hearing about the four-track machine yeah. and how it started. But quite a lot was done in a professional studio. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at, at both Abbey Road and Morgan Studios. So maybe... We have this image of the album being homespun, which it still is, and Mm. it still has that charm to it, but it also was, you know, cleaned up a little bit, Mm. you know, spruced up a bit in the studio. Yeah, he was he was running into some frustrations with the home setup. Um, I think um, Hottest Sun, for instance, you know, when he recorded it and it turned out to have distortion and, you know, he had to do a remake, um, things like that. He was having trouble, you know, the fact that he didn't have a mixer kind of became an issue in a way, you know, especially with drums. You know, it meant that, you know, the drums always had to pretty much go on first for the home recordings. And, you know, if you're just uh, improvising things like, you know, Mama Miss America and, and and some of the other instrumentals, the drums coming first isn't necessarily the best way to, to do it, but it has to be done because he didn't have like a click track or anything. You know, the drums had to be there for, for the steady beat. Mm. Um, but he was having trouble with it. Uh, and, you know, I think, I, I, I think in the end, after the last thing he recorded at home was junk, and I think after that, he decided, you know what, I'm going to go into the studio to mix these things anyway. Let me just use the real studio for the rest, you know. And also the fact that when he had the four-track machine, he had no VU meters there. That's right. So if if you're recording something that's distorting, you're not knowing that while you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. The machine didn't have meters? No. No. Because they would have been on the board, and he didn't have the board. Right. So it was basically uh, do a take, listen back, Mm -hmm. distorted, bring your levels down, do it again. Yeah. Until, you know, he got it. Uh, I had a question regarding your take and your research, Alan, and Ken's opinion on why. And we did briefly discuss this in a recent show, uh, why McCartney did not want any singles taken from the album. Yeah, there wasn't um, so far as we've run into there wasn't even any discussion of it you know it's not like there were memos back and forth about like should we release this and now nah, let's not you know it they're just it just didn't come up he just wanted to put this out don't know mm-hmm. why don't know well why. you know when we've had discussions like this and when we get people writing into us and my other podcast show and uh some people think that because let it be was coming out and that was going to be a single Mm-hmm. I don't know if they knew ahead of time, at least in the U.S., The Long and Winding Road was a single. It wasn't in the U.K. If they had known in advance that those singles were coming out, why would Paul be competing with himself? Right. You know, his own song with Maybe I'm Amazed and then Let It Be at the same time. Um, Maybe that was part of the reason. It could have been part of the reason, except that under those circumstances, either way, it's a win-win situation. <laughs> either his own record sells better or the Beatles record that he's on and wrote sells better. But like, he's got nothing to lose either way. Yeah. But but the other Beatles mm -hmm. might've been a a bit upset. (laughs) Well, yeah, absolutely. That's why they didn't want him to release it when he released it. 
um, mm. they wanted Let It Be to come out first. And I know, you know, was, I was talking about how Alan Klein would do these things to get under Paul's skin. I mean, the, the release of Lawn and Winding Road, I'm pretty convinced, is another one of those. Because it was not long after Paul wrote a letter to Klein saying, I want the strings, the harps, the female voices, all this stuff taken off. I want the Beatles instrumentation raised and don't ever touch my stuff again. Klein decided, okay, that's going to be the Beatles' next single after Let It Be. Uh, I don't think that's an accident. It did well. did quite well. <laughs> but, oh, it's number one. Yeah. yeah. Can't get better than that. But there's <laughs> something else I want to ask you, Alan, because according to what it says in Wikipedia, on March the 23rd of 1970, Phil Spector was working on the Let It Be album at Abbey Road Studios, mm -hmm. Studio Two, mm -hmm. and Paul, at the same time, was finishing up work on the McCartney album in Studio Four. Hmm. They were in the same building, and Paul has said that he wasn't aware of Phil's involvement with the album at that time? Mm, no, that can't. that isn't true. In the uh, legal papers for the lawsuit, Klein describes a meeting that all of the Beatles attended except John, and since John was his guy, there was never a problem with him getting John's agreement, in which he proposed to them hiring Phil Spector. And this was in, God, I think it was in November or December 69. It was pretty early. It was when they decided that Let It Be is going to be a film, not a TV special and the album will in effect be the soundtrack album and why don't we get someone like phil Spector, who incidentally was a client of alan klein uh in to produce it and they all agreed to it so paul paul knew specter was involved he didn't know what specter was going to do that was never run past him you know he didn't hear long and winding road till they left him a test pressing and he said WTF or words to that effect. Mm. <laughs> and there was no way that they could redo it and just delay the album a little bit longer? There was a way, but they wouldn't. I mean, Paul wrote back to them on April 14th demanding these changes. Um, the album wasn't going to be out at this point for a month almost. I think it came out May 8th. They definitely could have remixed Long and Winding Road, but they refused to do it. So that's how it was. Hmm. Wow. So the other Beatles and Klein and Spectre all said, we're not going to do this. I don't or know was they, it one person? Or I, I don't know if they said it out loud like that, you know, but it just never got done. They told Paul that there isn't time to remix it, but there was definitely time to remix it. You know, they had a well, month. Well, I could certainly... I can understand why Paul was really disgusted mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and in fact, the remixing of Long and Winding Road and the adding of the orchestration and all of that stuff was one of the causes listed in his lawsuit about why he needs to get away from the Beatles partnership. Because, mm. you know, his stuff's not being respected, not being treated properly. And uh, because, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I should even get into this, but... When he sued to break up the partnership so that he could get out of it, it was not a foregone conclusion that he would win. You know, the fact that there were four partners and he was one of them and had signed the agreement and was a director of the company, um, under English law, uh, apparently uh, weighs very heavily. So what he had to do was to prove that this was hurting his career and hurting him artistically. Uh, and so you had things like the Long and Winding Road orchestration being, you know, one of his causes of uh, grievance. Now, interestingly, the Long and Winding Road was orchestrated by the guy who did Thrillington. You know, so Paul right. wasn't, you know, that upset with him. But I, he was upset with the fact that this was not run past him before it was basically set in stone. And then even it didn't have to be set in stone when it was, it could have been fixed. So, you know, 
yeah it, it was it mm. was it, you, can, you can understand as, as you sort of go through all of the paperwork and the discussions and the notes back and forth and look at the occurrence on a like day by day lay, uh, basis you can totally understand why he's upset as upset as he is you know and then after McCartney came out he just went back up to Scotland it came out on the 17th of April he went to Scotland May 1st he never went back to London before going to New York in October to do Ram. Mm -hmm. He stayed in Scotland the whole summer. Then he went to France with Linda and the, and the girls, uh, Heather and, and Mary. And then from they left from Le Havre in France on the SS France to sail across the Atlantic to go to the sessions for Ram. And those lasted the rest of the year. So from May until I think it was, you know, early in 1971, he hadn't been back to uh, London. He did go back to Scotland once in that period, but not back mm. to London at all. So lots and lots of strange things that sort of attest to how angry he was about the whole situation, you know. I mean, he didn't want to do the lawsuit. He tried to get John to consider agreeing to let him out of the contract and and uh john sent back a postcard saying you know how and why or why and how i think in that order and paul wrote you know how sign a bit of paper that says so and why because we're not working together we're not the beatles i want out so john uh you know basically said, uh, you know, get the, get the other signatures and I'll consider it. And there's no evidence that he tried to get the other signatures, but he did meet with George in New York when George came to uh, do the mixing for, uh, not mixing, more like editing and the mastering of All Things Must Pass. George was there from the end of October. Oh. Uh, so, you know, they did meet and obviously got nowhere. And they had agreed to meet again in early January. And Paul canceled that. I think by then he was even more fed up with stuff that had happened in December. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So back to McCartney. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about the reviews? Do you guys remember reading any of the reviews, Ken? Not really, no. Hmm. And Darren? I'm not, I'm not sure I knew how to read yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, did you ever go back? You know, and read the... uh, I always, uh, I've always, um, you know, from the few publications that I had as my uh, education in the '70s, besides having the the music, I was always under the impression, which is the case, that you know, all of McCartney's records were getting uh, trashed by the press, and that started to change with Band on the Run. Yeah. Maybe a little bit Red Rose Speedway, but you know, band on the run. So, I mean, to me, I always thought, you know, the reviews were negative. So, you know, who cares what they had to say? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. So I, I mean that part of it again, by the time I picked up on it, uh, it was years later and, you know, I was pretty much forming my opinion on my own as this McCartney album that I have amongst all these other wings records, but I don't remember seeing anything, in the media at all about any of this. Yeah. You know, the reviews, there were some very positive reviews and there were some very negative reviews. I mean, people did react to the homespun aspect of it, especially after, as um, one or both of you said, you know, coming after Let It, uh, not Let It Be, uh, Abbey Road, <laughs> you know, that was a, a, a fantastically produced album and, and this was more homespun and that did bother a number of the critics and Paul responded to them. He sent a couple of telegrams or letters out basically saying, you know what? You're wrong. <laughs> 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 but, um, there was something else that happened, um, which was like, this was, once this came out, it was really the beginning of the John camp versus Paul camp, you know, in the press and, to a degree on air, hard to do it on air, but, you know, you had things like Howard Smith's show, who Howard Smith would have John on for interviews all the time, 
and John would say what he had to say. But especially in Rolling Stone, which is kind of interesting because this was like way before Wenner's big interview with John on December 8th, 1970. So here we are in the middle of, you know, April 70. Wenner went to London and interviewed Paul McCartney on April 9th. McCartney did not give him a copy of the self-interview or the press kit or it seems even the album. I mean, when the story came out on in the uh, May 30th issue of Rolling Stone, there's no indication that he had heard the album or read the interview or anything like that. But a couple of weeks later, there was an interview with John who responds very angrily to the self-interview. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's the title of the article was one guy standing there shouting, I'm leaving, you know, and he really takes off after Paul. And in the same issue, the album is reviewed and it's not, I mean, there are a couple of things the reviewer liked. I can't remember what it was, but he really disliked basically the negativity in the review seemed to have more to do with the self interview than with anything else. And that's an odd thing because that self interview was not released to the general public. You know, it was just a press release, but he sort of, he's sort of charging Paul with being, you know, outrageously aggressive and uncharitable towards the other Beatles. And that was part of, I think, that that setting up of the John versus Paul camp. You know, you would read Rolling Stone, which in those days was like, you know, the Bible for this kind of music. And, you know, you'd see the story from John saying one guy standing there shouting, I'm leaving. And then this album just sort of tearing apart McCartney and the press release and his attitude and everything about it. You know, if you look at it from a, an almost political point of view, you could, <laughs> you could see the, the, you know, the two sides staking their territory there. So I suggest you go back and read it. You can, you know, get um, some of the stuff is online. And there used to be, of course, that Rolling Stone DVD set. Do you remember that? Do you guys have that? Rolling Stone put out its all of its issues until the sometime in the 2000s on a set of DVDs. You put it in your computer, you could look up anything you want. But oh, yeah. I think I I think I have that. Yeah, it, it probably yeah. is not playable on a current computer. No. You know, Mark Lewison has an old computer that he maintains just to be able to access that set. And I'm thinking I should do that too, because <laughs> you know it's funny when we when we need something from Rolling Stone. I mean, I get a call from Adrian saying, "Could you look up, you know, this, you know, the article about one guy standing there or something, or the review of McCartney?" And I have the actual issues of Rolling Stone that I've saved since I was a kid, and I open them up and I try I find these articles, but these things are so crumbly, you know, it's hard to turn a page without ripping it. It's horrible. I really want that computer set to work again, so I might have to get a computer and put on an old version of, of Windows or something. Well, I was going to uh, ask you guys, as uh, we wind things down here, on your favorite songs on the album and if they've changed over the years. I'd say, I mean, it has to be maybe I'm amazed and I don't think it's changed for me over the years, although Junk is up there. Ken? Um, I would agree with you right there, Alan. Maybe I'm amazed as a classic now, but I do like all of the um, acoustic songs with the vocals on them. Although I, I will say that, you know, that would be something is one of those songs that to me is a, like a slight composition. It's one of those songs that McCartney does from time to time where there's only a couple of lines and lyrics, yeah. but it's everything else that he puts into it that makes it an interesting recording, much like Why Don't We Do It in the Road was. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's You like the sound of his voice. You like how hot the, the bass is in that song. Mm -hmm. You like his drumming on it. It's everything else that he puts into it. It's not a great composition, yeah. but it's an interesting recording. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the album so much more now than I ever have, mainly because... 
it's a combination of songs that were Finnish songs, like Me I'm Amazed, Junk, Every Night, um, Manu Was Lonely, which, by the way, that was the last song that I've read that he worked on, and he, he wrote it the same day that he recorded it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so talk about spontaneity. To write a song and then record it all in one day, um, that was pretty cool. But I also find it really interesting when Paul does uh, improvisation, which doesn't happen all that often. And something like Valentine Day is one of those songs that he just, you know, mm-hmm. went and recorded. That he did at home on the four track. But it's just, it's like when you see Paul in concert and there are those rare moments when he plays lead guitar and plays solos like on the Abbey Road medley or Let Me Roll It, I want to see more of that, mm-hmm. you know, or I want to hear more of that. Something like Valentine Day is like that. This is what he thinks up off the top of his head as he's recording. Karina Croy is a lot like that. I enjoy that stuff so much more now than I did back then. Mm-hmm. It's easy to gravitate towards every night, and maybe I'm amazed in those songs, but I like all the other stuff that he that he does as well. And it's also interesting that he brought back Hot as Sun, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which we didn't even talk about. I mean, that was a song that, an instrumental that Paul wrote in the late 50s that the Beatles used to do. Right. Live in concert. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there are recordings that were made of Hot as Sun with lyrics that were added to the song. The lyrics were actually done by, I'm sure it's one of Alan's top lyricists, Tim Rice. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a singer, Elaine Page, who's very well known in Britain, big uh, Broadway show, uh, musical entertainer. She recorded it. That's worth checking out to hear Hottest Son with lyrics, even though Paul didn't write them. But I like that combination of Finnish songs And then songs that were very spontaneous that he just made up in the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish there was more of the 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 experimental stuff, because these days, you know, something like Karina Crory or Loop, which I know I've said in the show, I love a lot. Those kind of songs that you don't hear enough of. And a lot of people accuse Paul of being so commercial and being, you know, the pop master that he is. And then when he does things like Karina Crory, a lot of people don't get it. Right. Right. They don't they don't devote the time to really listen to it. It's you know, it's making enough stuff on the spot. Yeah. You know, that's what they do in the avant garde world. You know, it's very much like that. So, well, you've you got know, glasses find, here, glasses, which, also, uh, you know, I, I, I've seen I've reviewed a million pieces <laughs> that were exactly like it, you know, Um and I, I always wonder whether, you know, any of the players sort of, you know, think about the fact that McCartney did this in 1970. I mean, the, the whole idea of using glasses musically goes back to like the 14th century. But, mm. um, you know, it's that's that's part of that avant garde side that he sometimes, you know, will bring up is like, you know, how come everyone says John's the avant gardist, you know. So, I mean, and, and you know, and those glasses were specifically tuned to you know the pitches he wanted um so that it would resonate in a certain way as a you know a chord and uh you know it would 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 sound okay it wasn't just like hey let's get some glasses and rub our fingers he 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 did some work on that mm. and also the thing about suicide being tacked on the end of that medley mm. and only a few seconds of it i mean yeah. i don't understand what that was all about because when the the uh, remaster came out for the McCartney album. They had the full version of that. So sort, of the, why... sort of the full version. If you listen to it, the beginning is kind of missing. And the reason the beginning is kind of missing is because he had recorded a bunch of songs, including Suicide, and then went back and had decided that he didn't want to keep the stuff that he had recorded and wiped over it with glasses and when Ugh. glasses ended, that's exactly where the take of suicide begins that you hear in the you know full version that's that's on the among the bonus tracks. Um, but as you if you listen to it, you'll hear it begins exactly the way it begins coming out of glasses. That's all he has. It's uh. just that now he has the rest of the track, and why not put it out? So, but the beginning's missing on. So, it. In, so in other words. Glasses, he recorded over some stuff that he did, including 
suicide, once he was done with glasses, hit stop, what's left on the tape is mm-hmm. part of suicide, and that's how that part ends up sounding the way it does on the McCartney album when yeah. he tacks it onto to Hide the Sun. Yeah, because he, he doesn't really tack it on. He just sort of fades it out. It's already tacked on because when glasses ended, suicide was still under there, and it comes and, peeking out. And, and he I must find have, that fascinating. Yeah, he must have just liked the way you know that sounded, but for just a couple of seconds when he was mixing and just sort of mixed it like right down because it, it kind of created a quirky little thing there. Right, right. My favorite tunes on the album... I mean, I always went for the edgier songs. I remember always liking uh, Ooh You and To Mama Miss uh, uh, as my kind of like uh, left of center picks from that album. Mm-hmm. But I remember always, that was always my favorite uh, part of the album, the opening of Side 2. Quick memory, growing up in the 70s, watching cartoons on New York City television, mm-hmm. Channel 5, Almost positive it was Channel 5. Could have been 11, but I think it was Channel 5, which at the time was WNEW uh, television. Mm-hmm. Uh, right? Yeah. It was WNEW, Metro Media, TV, Channel 5. And then it was 11 was WPIX, still is. Mm-hmm. Uh, for their weekday afternoon cartoons, used a sped-up version of Hottest Sun as the theme song. So if somebody was a McCartney fan, at the television station, decided that come three o'clock or whatever time the afternoon cartoon started, they would begin that block of cartoon pro with a mon. It would be, I believe, there was like a like a, a, a audio a video montage of you know the different cartoon characters that were coming up was the Flintstones and Bugs Bunny and that kind of stuff. And the theme song was Hot as Sun, but it was sped up to I'm assuming. 45 uh, <laughs> RPM. Uh, so they took the album, turned it up to 45, used a portion of it, and that was the theme song to the uh, weekday afternoon cartoons. And again, I'm pretty sure it was Channel 5 WNEW uh, that did that in the 70s. I think, um, I think it was Channel 11, and I think it was to introduce Popeye. Could have been. It could definitely could have been, yes. Yeah. I've always heard Popeye. Popeye. Was on 11. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, yeah, and it definitely could have been because I watched both channels growing up <laughs> and uh, always got a kick out of the fact that they used that uh, that song on M- the McCartney album, Hot as Sun, sped up. And I think I tried once, not with my copies here at home, but I think at WFUV once, I uh, a long time ago, you know, put it on the turntable played Hot as Sun, turned it up to 45, and it was like, yeah, that's what they did. <laughs> you know, like that, and with all the little clips of, mm. you know, the cartoons that were coming up. And it worked uh, very well yeah. for that purpose, yeah. It did, yeah. You said it worked well, Ken? I think so. Yeah, 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 it did, it was fun. But, uh, so, that was another thing, which, if I had McCartney... Like I said, my, my 77, 76, because it was not an Apple, it was the Black Capital. That meant I was watching cartoons still at that point in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway. I have I one was... last question here. Mm-hmm. Would, would either of you know, I know Paul has said that when it came to the song Suicide, that he intended to give it to Frank Sinatra to record. Mm-hmm. Did Frank ever get it? Obviously, he never recorded it. Um, Paul said that he sent it to him, but he never told us what Sinatra's actual response was. He just told us, you know, he must have been thinking, what kind of, what is this guy sending me a song suicide for? You know? <laughs> so we don't know that Sinatra actually said or thought that. Um, but yeah, but I think he did get it to him. Mm. Okay. Hmm. You know, suicide was also a really old song. It, it was it was also from the you know late fifties or so when you know because it was the kind of song that that his father would have liked so right. so a couple of these songs date way back I mean if you look at the track list you've got stuff dating from like nineteen fifty eight all the way up to the second he recorded them because he's improvising them you know mm-hmm. uh, and a few like not just um, 
Teddy Boy, but Hottest Sun was done during the Let It Be sessions, too, briefly. Yeah. Not sure about Every Night. I think Every Night was, too. I think Every Night was done during Get Back, Let It Be. Yeah. So, yeah, so it, it's it's really, I mean, there are so many things about it that make it a fascinating album, even more than when it just came out. I mean, just because of the history between now and then, and what we found out about that time that that he did it. You know, it's uh, it's it's really an interesting document. And, you know, whether it's because of it's starting on a four track machine or whether because it was doctored up a little bit in the studio and some of the recordings are purely from a track in the studio mm -hmm. to my ears. When I listen to the remaster, it sounds absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. The sound quality on this album is amazing. You know, yeah, maybe some of it had to do with you know, direct sending sound right to the four track. Maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. Could be. But and I mean, you know, we're not talking about a consumer level tape deck here. You know, this was the, this was one of the machines they recorded Pepper on. So mm. you know, it's it's a it, it, I think it cost at the time, we're talking about like nineteen sixty six dollars, something like eight thousand dollars for the for the deck. Um, which today would be multiples of that, you know, just because of inflation and difference in the dollar value. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that was sort of a, a you know free for all um, overview of the McCartney album. I hope um, some of you or most of you out there got something out of it. Maybe learned some new facts. Uh, maybe come to appreciate the album in a different way and. Definitely hope you'll put it on and give it a spin. So let's um, get everyone's contact information. I'll start with Darren. All right. If you want to shoot me an email, you can contact me at WFUV. My WFUV email address is Darren DeVivo, D A R R E N D E V I V O, at WFUV.org. Or go to Facebook. Uh, I'm always on Facebook. I have two pages. Uh, one, simply Darren DeVivo. The other, Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. I'm going to be doing a little revamping of those pages as soon, as soon as I can figure out how to revamp them and what to turn them into. Uh, but uh, I'm there at Facebook, and that's always a great way to uh, reach out and stay in touch with me. So, Ken? Okay, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. The website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Uh, just recently, I did a new interview with Jerry Hammock, who is the author of uh, a series of books called The Beatles Recording Reference Manual. Uh, the most recent one, which is volume four, it takes you through all of 1968 and early 69. And we had a conversation about recordings from that year and, uh, well, spanning the whole Beatles catalog as a group and it really was a fascinating conversation so many things I've wanted to ask like were there any recordings that were erased by the Beatles mm -hmm. and also things like um, how he feels about what Paul said about she said she said leaving the recording session and that George played bass did he really play bass on the finished recording uh, things like that, um, mono versus stereo mixes, and um, what was it like to jump from four track to eight track for the Beatles? It's really a very good conversation. Not not super technical, but you can find it on my website. Um, it's on interviews page four. There's actually another interview on that very same page that I did with Jerry on the early Beatles recordings. So the newest ones are uh, parts three and four, but they're all good, parts one through four. And um, you can win a copy of that book now as part of one of nine prizes on my Beatles trivia and games page. I just want to mention one thing. Last week, it was a very frustrating week for me because my website was down for about four days. And because of that, since I have a trivia question or a, a Beatles game every single week, what I've done is I've extended the amount of time that you can answer last week's trivia along with playing along with this week's trivia. So twice as many chances for you to win uh, this coming week on my website on the Beatles Trivia and Games page. Nine prizes to pick from, and um, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. 
the next Talk More Talk show, which is next Monday, we'll be talking about the Ogner Rats TV special uh-huh. from 1978 and what we think about it. Um, that's an all solo Beatles show. Once in a while, we cover the group. And that's on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. It's Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. You can write in as the show's going on. Tell us your thoughts about that particular topic or what's going on in the news. I do news in that show as well. And um, that's about it for me. Okay. And you can contact all of us collectively at our group email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. That's one word things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We also have a Twitter feed. It's at things we said fab um, and a Facebook page, two Facebook pages, even things we said today, Beatles radio fans, which is the main one. And there's also a plain old things we said today on Facebook. You can contact me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen remixed. And, um, I guess that's the way to do it. So for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen, thanking you for joining us this time, hoping you'll join us next time, and we'll see you then when you do. Mm-hmm.